everyone, welcome to another fabulous webinar brought to us by Brain Shark and Sales Hacker. Um, I know that attendees are going to be coming in. It sounds like today was the day of webinars and trainings and sessions. So as you're joining, make sure that your chat is turned to panelists and attendees. Drop your LinkedIn link in there. Tell us where you're coming from. I am coming from freezing cold Fort Worth, Texas. I was just talking about this. We were about to get a bunch of snow. And by a bunch, I mean two to four inches, which apparently is not much snow for the rest of the world. Uh, but we're so excited to have you today, Julie. Where are you coming from again? I am coming from sunny South Florida, so it is warm. It's a little more humid this time of year than I like. I didn't go outside for long, um, but yeah, South Florida, great, great place. No snow. No snow, no snow at all. You know, I think my husband and I were looking at uh, taking a trip out to Fort Lauderdale, maybe in the future, who knows. Um, I've never been, never really done uh, much in Florida other than my fabulous trips to Disney World. Um, oh, we've got snowy Seattle. Welcome, welcome. That's another place I love to visit. Um, oh, and then, oh, you're from Girls Club too. Love seeing our Girls Club people on here. That's always exciting. Don't forget, tell us who you are, where you're coming from. As we're waiting for more people to pop in, I'm also going to launch a poll. Tell us what's your role. Are you a rep? Are you a manager? Are you a sales enablement director? Are you a VP? So that way we can really uh, tailor our discussion today and make sure it's really valuable for you. Hey, Gigi, how's it going? It's amazing. Germany. I love seeing all of you that are coming in, that are on almost all of our sessions. It's so much fun, especially since it's probably much later in the afternoon for some of you over in Europe. Hey, Melissa, coming in from Toronto. That's a place. I'd love to go up to Canada. It's wonderful. Have you been? I, You know what? I went to Canada-ish, Canada-adjacent, Horseshoe Falls, over up closer to Niagara. And I went up there, I had to have been like maybe 10, so I don't really count that as a trip. Um, but I, I'm itching to go up to Vancouver. We've got a bunch of coworkers up there, so I'd love to get up there. My daughter played ice hockey, so uh, it ah. allowed us to travel a little bit in a few uh, tournaments in Canada, and it was just wonderful. Great experience, great people, great culture, so really fabulous. I love it. And the Canadian geese, for those of you that watch Letterkenny. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would love to go. You know, I've always wanted to go up to Whistler. I'm a big skier and snowboarder, so... Going up there, I think, would be really cool. There was this trashy reality TV show I used to watch on Bravo, and it was talking about, like, being a concierge up in Whistler and, like, just the crazy things. Like, oh, we want you to do, like, a, a winter picnic on top of a mountain and how you have to take gondolas up. It was crazy. So I would love to go. Hey, Diane, welcome from New York City. Okay, I'm going to end the poll here. It looks like we've got a large amount in leadership. It's so great to see that. I love being encouraged uh, by seeing all these amazing leaders wanting to learn how to make their reps' lives better, how to really go above and beyond, how to really understand what is making a rep successful. And here's the results for those of you interested. I just popped those up. So um, I know we're waiting for a few people to come in. But before we get started, wanted to welcome all of you personally. My name is Katie Ray from Sales Hacker. I'm so excited to have you a part of this session today. We are going to get into all the nitty gritties about really understanding what is making your rep successful. How do you replicate that? How do you grow quickly? How do you grow efficiently? Um, really understanding your reps why. For those of you that have attended webinars uh, recently, we kind of talked a little bit about how do you motivate, but now this is really getting into the why. So I'm excited for today's discussion. Uh, please, once again, just a few housekeeping things. This will be recorded, so make sure you check your email within 24 hours of the event. There will be an email, hopefully with this deck, um, so that you can access it, reference it, check it out. Um, so it will be recorded. Secondly, make sure that you have your chat turned to panelists and attendees. We want to hear from you. We want this to be as interactive as possible. Tell me about experiences. Type them out. If you have any questions, you can either toss them into the chat or you can toss them into the Q&A field. 
below next to Ray's hand. So, um, please don't hesitate to throw things in. We'll be asking questions to Julie as we go through today's session. Um, but with all that said, if you are trying to remember why you are here, you are here to learn everything about what is making your rep successful today and how you're able to repeat it. I'm going to let Julia introduce herself and we'll kind of go from there. Thanks so much, Katie. And as Katie said, my name is Julie Greenfield. I am the Sales Enablement and Readiness Director at BrainShark. I work with sales leaders, reps, and many throughout our organization to identify areas of opportunity, formulate a plan, and to enhance their skills and improve on our processes and the buying experience. Lucky for me, I'm able to leverage our own solution, BrainShark, to accomplish that through our scorecards, our content creation, learning, and coaching platforms. Now, in my seven years of enablement, I've seen consistent recipes for success, and I'm sure that all of you have seen these as well, and it will be of no surprise, but the buying process and times are really changing, and we need to continue to change with them, and we need to evaluate what's working, what isn't, and we need to be ready to pivot all while keeping our company initiatives in mind, and that's what we're really here to talk about today. Perfect. Well, let's jump into this. Perfect. So we're going to start with the flow in the way that I've been successful and how I plan it out. And I think about designing and executing programs as well as coaching both managers and reps. First, we're going to talk about that importance of alignment. We saw that there's people from every facet of, you know, sales and just in general of an organization on our call today. And we'll talk about how we move from those tips into doing research, cover the always fun and sometimes controversial topic of metrics. Oops, sorry about that. And then we'll bring it all together in how we develop our teams. And being that mixed group, you know, we really have different perspectives, we have different priorities, and we all have different motivations. Some of them are professional motiv motivations as well as our personal ones. And for all of us to be successful, we need to come together and we need to align both to our own objectives as well as the companies. And that's really where we're going to get started today. So I want you to think back. And what was the last time someone told you no without explaining why? Maybe it was the last time you told a child no without explaining why. And think about how you reacted to that, how they reacted. There's this inherent need for us to really understand why. Now, those who know me personally know that I tend to dig in when I'm told no, and there's no context behind why. Now, this part might seem a little contradictory, but I do have a growth mindset, and I fully appreciate understanding What's the reasoning? What's the decision? Let's talk it out. Let's have a discussion around why there's a no. And oftentimes, I will be the first one to admit I had an aha moment and I was like, oh, I didn't think about that. Okay. It's that change management piece. It's like going through the grieving process, right? You have to kind of come to that and go, okay, I didn't get it. If we're not explaining that, it, people just shut down. So my point around all of this when we're going to implement change, we're going to implement, you know, a different way of doing something, learning programs, we're going to ask them to practice their pitches, all of these things. We need to help our reps understand the why. Managers need to understand the why. Sales enablement has to understand the why. And that's why you see that graphic, right? We are all cogs in our wheel to success and we have to work together. And if you haven't heard, which I'm sure you all have, but just in case, Simon Sinek, great person on this topic. There's a TED talk that we'll throw up in the chat that you guys can all watch later, his books. All of it really puts it into great perspective on why, explaining the why is so important, why it's impactful to businesses when they're able to do that. So a key element that I touched on just briefly, but it, I want to reiterate it, is this, and, and you know, having the leadership and the directors on the role, on the call. Sales enablement, Managers, frontline managers, senior leadership in sales, and even across the org, right? We have revenue enablement, field enablement, change, you know, there's lots of roles that are changing. We all have to work together. We all have to have that seat at the table. We have to be having these discussions. 
and understand you're making changes in roles and responsibilities. We're, you know, need to couple that with what are the skills, what's the knowledge that your teams need to be successful in those roles. We all have to talk together so that we can be successful. And then we come together as that united front to those reps. That is what is really key here. And part of that is setting expectations, right? When employees have a clear understanding of what's expected of them, they're more engaged. When they're more engaged, they increase their productivity. And we'll cover some more of that later on. But that's that cycle that we're looking for. And last, but certainly not least, and one of the most important things, and this gets left out. I've been in it. I've seen where people leave it out. You need a feedback loop. People want to feel heard. They have a need to feel heard and provide feedback. You need to have a mechanism to do that. We also want to take a step back and see, are the changes we're making, are they successful? Are, are, is that messaging being received by buyers in the, in the spirit that we intended, right? We have the best of intentions when we're developing these programs. But if you just set it and forget it and don't have this feedback, you really don't know if it's working. You also need to be sure that you're monitoring if you created a process that creates friction, both for a buyer as well as your employees. And we really want to be able to provide that mechanism, be able to pivot quickly. We're not always going to be able to pivot. And sometimes we need to go back to explain why we're not and explain that no. But we need to make sure that we have that mechanism in place. So I've seen a lot of chat coming in through there. So I want to take a pause, Katie, and see if we have some questions. Yeah, well, one of the things that I, I was curious about, and I'm sure we'll probably get into a little bit more, is as we're talking about like setting expectations and communicating um, and like really providing the full scope of, of why, one of the things you mentioned was really investing in our members and, and making them happier. What do you think that does for reducing churn inside of a company as well? Oh my goodness. We're foreshadowing, but that's okay. Cause it's, it's, a <laughs> I was topic. like, I feel like she may get to that later. So but, I don't know. <laughs> but it is so important. It is like my passion, you know, and, um, absolutely there is correlation between all of these things. And it was funny because I was like, Oh, I'm going to find some links and it's Harvard business review. It's a few years old. There's absolutely data and articles out there. And, you know, I know people, if you bring something and I'm one of them, oh, 2016, 2018, you know, they're going to go, oh, that's old data. Well, some data is still tried and true. Mm -hmm. The data is out there. And, you know, there's lots of other orgs that talk about the data as well, that employee engagement, productivity, the expectations, all of that leads to retention, right? Yep. The and where we, so as an enablement professional, right, where do we spend a good majority of our time? Onboarding. Do we really want to just be onboarding new people? Well, if you're a growth company, sure. But if you're a more stable company, no, because then that means you have churn. And so we want to, the cost of recruiting, hiring, onboarding, and then retaining just the cost alone in your people and your resources, there's one cost. And there's all kinds of numbers out there on it, right? Then what is the cost if it's an open territory, the loss in territory and loss in productivity to your organization? So is it worth it? Absolutely, it's worth it in the investment. And I'd also have you kind of a little side note, right? Think about your career pathing. Think about how you're helping people move within your organization to again, reduce that friction, reduce the turn, reduce your cost of doing business. And then you're bringing in new people, sure, into those entry level roles, right? That's the kind of organization that, you know, we strive to be and we do a lot of that as well. And that's what we, you know, see as very successful. I'm also curious too, as we talk about this feedback loop in, in making changes, learning about the results of them and and as we continue to grow and make changes and evolve, how do you, and, and I don't know, this could be once again later on, but how do you create that culture, right? Because it can be really challenging to go into a company and you're like, I have these fabulous ideas and you're all going to love them, but nobody actually implements them. What do you do with that? So it's, it's, it goes back to alignment. It goes back to our topic. Yeah. It starts at the top. I saw someone put it leader. It's a leadership thing, right? Yeah. Thanks, Gigi. It is. It's a leadership thing. This, it starts at the top. 
you have to have commitment at the top. Now, Brain Shark, you know, a small, medium business. It is not a large, I know there's people out there with thousands upon thousands of employees. That's not us, right? But I have worked for an organization with thousands of employees and it did still start at the top with the CEO that brought that directive in. It goes into his leadership or her leadership team, right? And then they, and it is, it's that trickle down effect. Um, it's always a development. I have been on calls with, you know, chief people, chief HR, you know, CHROs, officers and said, hey, we built this. It's working. But now it, we have to take two steps backwards because something broke it. Like any relationship, it's a constant work in progress and it takes everyone it, and everyone has to realize that. And it starts at the top and it starts at the bottom and we have to come together all in the middle. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. Which brings us to, I think it's a good time to segue into our next topic, which is research. Because I do want to make sure we get through everything. You could tell I'm so passionate about all of this. So we're at the beginning of the year, right? Many of us have already spent Q4. Sometimes it's bleeding into Q1, depending on what happens. But we're setting the priorities for the year, right? And when we think about our overall ob objectives, the company objectives, how they correlate to the various roles. We need to really understand how each of us can influence what those objectives are, right? It really takes that holistic view. We kind of touched on it with the values and the culture. It takes a holistic view to take a step back and see and do the analyzing that needs to be done. It's not just about, did we hit the number? We'll get more into that metrics, but it's not just about that. What happened along the way? What number was it, you know, was it the renewal or the retention of customers? Was it the net new business we were bringing in? Is it a new product we launched? Did we hit those numbers or not? Where were our strengths? Where were our weaknesses? And we really need to understand that. And, you know, even if an organization goes, oh, we hit the number, um, our customer NPS scores, you know, they were great. Da, 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 da. Like, okay. You know, maybe you were, you know, one of these thriving companies because you were in medical or PPE and what have you. And that's great. But for organizations to continue to grow and develop, you have to continuously improve. Right. So you still are taking that step back and looking at that holistic view and why we're here today. Right. We want to talk about reps and rep success and, you know, just looking at, oh, these five reps, these 10, these 20 reps hit, hit quota. Great. Okay. Does that give us any information on what they did, how they did it? No. We have to stop looking at just that lagging indicator. And we need to look at what are the insights we can glean onto the way they work. What are they doing differently? They're still doing the same things everybody else is doing, but they're obviously doing them differently because they're hitting those numbers. We look at their process. We design playbooks around it. It's not just about AEs. It's about all the roles in your organization that you're trying to look and measure on. So maybe it's, you know, the team um, that solutions consultant, sales engineers, whatever you want to call your, your demo team, right? What is it that they're doing? What was their prep like? How, how did they have that discovery call or what were their calls like? These are the things we're looking at. Development reps. We all have to have development, right? development reps. How were they leveraging the research tools you have in place? What kind of content were they providing? What were their cadences like? Right? What was it that worked for that rep? These this is what we're doing. We're doing the research, what worked, what didn't work, meeting back with the managers, maybe even interviewing the reps. So it's a combination of some of it is the data we can mine and then some of it is more of that subjective data, right? That we're having those interviews and those conversations. Um, one of the other ways, really big and popular, any way you want to say, there's tons of ways to record. We're recording via Zoom. You have many other conversational intelligence tools out there. Well, however you're mining data, you're looking at finding out what was the success of those high achievers, what worked. And then we compare it, right? We compare it across um, that data with those that are struggling. We identify those gaps so that we can address them with the coaching and the content that we're all so, you know, used to. Now, here's what normally happens in our world, which is, and I just did this too, right? And um, 
there's a list of different things and different items because not everyone is in the same place. So a lot of times you have this list that you go, oh my gosh, I'm what we call a solo sales enabler, right? Maybe you're only a team of one or two, if you're lucky, three or four, right? But we, we can't do all these things. We can't. Okay. So that's when you go back to your alignment and you prioritize and you bring it together and you take where the gaps are, where the company objectives which ones are going to move the needle the fastest? Where can you make those big differences? And that's where you're going to prioritize and then build out that development timeline. Okay. So one of the questions we have, and I think it kind of goes to a little bit earlier of what you were talking about, whenever we're looking at alignment, we're looking at a holistic view of processes and what the alignment will look like. Um, what other functions, especially with onboarding and sales enablement, what other functions should be involved in that sales enablement discussion? Oh my gosh, I love it. So, and shame on me. I briefly talked about, you know, the chief people officer or CHRO, but you have to be aligned with your people, HR, whatever, you know, it's all fun buzzwords yeah. now. You have to be aligned with that team. Okay. In the perfect world organization, right? Your um your people team, your HR team has what I would call that foundational skill set, that foundation of onboarding that everyone who enters the company, regardless of role, has. They, that's the foundations, right? That's where you are talking about and you're discussing the values of the company and what the culture is like. And it just gives that employee experience, right? When you first went into her, you're like, wow, okay, this is, again, level set the expectations of the foundation foundational elements of the company then you're bringing in okay now what do i need to do to be a sales professional okay what are the very specific roles that i have you know tasks activities what is expected of me same thing customer success okay you know engineering whatever the case may be what i've done and it's really successful is you do need to give a holistic view um, of the organization so it's really fun to bring in someone else as part of your own sales onboarding as well, right? You might bring somebody in from product. You might bring somebody in from customer success to come talk about how you're going to work with their teams. What are their expectations? Um, it just allows the visibility. It, you know, just gives them another person, another layer, helps explain that why. So the more you can bring in people from around, the better. And definitely you're working hand in hand with your, your people HR team. Awesome. That's perfect. Okay. Anything else on our research? No, we're good. All right. Now we touched on metrics. So let's take a deeper dive. All right. Now. There is no shortage of metrics, right, in a sales organization. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, put it in the chat, whatever you want. If you work in an org where there are too few metrics that you're tracking, because I've never seen it, right? Um, and again, oftentimes, I, I know I'm repeating it, I think it's worthwhile to say, it's all in that quote attainment, <clears throat> which isn't giving us what we need, Right. We, we talked about that. There's so many steps along the way in our selling process, right? The sales process, the buyer's journey that we have to look at to be able to pinpoint, <clears throat> pardon me, the skills, the knowledge, where are the gaps, where's the strengths, what are we doing, right? I was part of an organization that had been tracking so many metrics, right? But they weren't attaining the desired goals. Luckily, they took a step back, right? And they had this initiative to look at, okay, what are things we can actually manage, right? You have to take a step back. What, you know, sometimes you're tracking things that really are out of your control. You can't manage. We can manage activities. We can work with our, our teams on the activities that they do, right? Mm -hmm. To get to those desired outcomes. So what really was successful was, again, leadership starting at the top. So the sales leadership, Sales enablement, because of the partnership, all read cracking the sales management code. Hmm. Okay, We'll put the link in the chat if you haven't read it. Um, highly recommend it because it there's going to be a lot of similarities in our metrics. 
across orgs, but then there's ones that are different. It's, you know, it depends on what you're doing, right? Software, manufacturing, whatever. What are the activities that get you to that end outcome you're looking for, that get to the sale or get to whatever you're looking for? So it really did help us. Everyone came together at the highest level, defined what metrics would be successful for, for the organization, communicated it out, and communicated it beyond, beyond sales, right? over to customer success, over to product, so that everyone knew, okay, why are AEs focused on this? Why are the sales engineers focused on that? Why are the ADRs, BDRs focused on this? Well, okay, now you know why, because you know what's being tracked and why we're hmm. tracking it. Okay, so hopefully that, that kind of helps you there. So one of the things, right, we talk all the time about our development reps because, you know, they're, they're your junior reps. They're the ones usually that you're really working with to fine tune their skills and continue to grow them. So, you know, let's say you're tracking the number of meetings held. Okay. And you can begin to determine if they need development around qualification because maybe they don't have as many meetings held right? Versus their peers. So, you know, those, that's what we're looking at. AEs, same thing. We're tracking meetings. Some organizations might go into, I want to track a discovery meeting. I want to track a negotiation meeting. That really gets you into the nitty gritty of, okay, now I know where they're struggling in that process. And when we're looking at their historical data, where are they in their sales stages, right? What's the average, their sales stage? Okay, what's the average for them, for their own historically with inside of each one of those stages? Now let's compare them to their peers. Okay, where there's a gap, right? Every, the, you know, and the, and the screenshot we have here kind of gives you an idea, red, yellow, green, it helps you easily identify it. Um, so we really want to be able to, to track those items. Our demo team, it's the same thing. We're looking at, the number of demos, maybe they've been on technical calls, right? Those activities that we know lead into influencing the buying pro process. I, I am curious, you know, we talked about how there's so many metrics that we can track mm -hmm. and there's a lot of options. What are, I don't know, maybe the top three or four, maybe five that you would say are like bread and butter. You need to always be tracking these. So in a very several right? So it really is indicative to the role. Um, think about the activities that lead to that outcome. So, you know, we're tracking meetings, right? We do track the demos that are held and conducted. Um, those are the items that we want to make sure that reps are doing, right? Um, when you can so it's kind of like you have that side of it, uh, you know, then you're also looking at, and this kind of, okay. So it's, it, you know, opportunities created, sorry, I was trying to think back. Okay. The number of opportunities created and the dollar amount of those opportunities. Okay. Now, one thing you have to be careful of when you set all of this up and you're communicating, it's not just the quantity, it's the quality, right? Because bad data is bad data. You know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, and we really need to be mindful that whatever environment we're creating, we're getting the desired behavior and looking at the quality, not just the quantity. We don't ever want to drive to, and here's a really good example. Let's say your development reps have, um, they can be comped on just scheduling a meeting. Doesn't mean the meeting was held or not. Okay. They just schedule it. Okay. They're comped on it. All right. Well, if the meeting's not held and it's not a discovery or quality meeting, that doesn't really help us get to our end result. So what if we changed and we do a comp on the meeting held or that opportunity creation, right? Like you keep taking it a next step further because now we look at and say, okay, they're going to be a little more diligent in their qualification and discussions, right? Then that leads us to what is that end. So you really start with the end in mind and then bring it, bring it back. So one of the things, this was really interesting because, you know, when I think about sales hacker and I know reps that are on and, and then just even for the managers that are on too, it's really the onus of us all 
to own our own destiny, right? We should be mindful. We should know how we're being measured. We should be looking at dashboards and go, where am I? Where are my gaps? Where do I need help? And um, it's so funny because I always pride myself not to use sports as a good analogy, but I couldn't help myself as a Floridian, right? To use. And I never thought these words would come out of my mouth. Those who know me, especially all of my colleagues, former and present that are in New England, right? Tom Brady, 43 years old, seventh Super Bowl win. Now, I would like to know if anyone out there thinks that he's just sitting back waiting for his coaches to tell him what he needs to work on. Seven Super Bowls, 43 years old. I highly do doubt that that's what he's doing, right? He's self-aware. He's, you know, reflecting on his, what he did. I mean, no doubt, right? fabulous at what he does. Why? Because he's looking at how he can always improve. He reaches out to the people that he knows can help him in achieving the goals that he wants, right? So he takes that ownership. We all need to take the same ownership. And that's what's really important. You know, when we're working with our HR and people teams, I often, you know, that's a conversation that I have with them as well, is that frustration that employees don't embrace their own destiny, that they're not reaching out. They're just waiting for someone else to just be like, oh, hey, here, there's a training over here available. Well, yes, we need to communicate it, but you need to also be looking. So I thought it was a little timely and, you know, had to celebrate uh, our, our win here in Florida. But those are the reps that are most successful, the ones that are self-aware, the ones that are reaching out, you know, um, and trying to find those added uh, trainings that they can do. Now, I'm curious if we can kind of dig in a little bit more on either attributes of, of successful reps, um, because I know that's something that for those of us that are on here that are wanting to be hiring managers or are hiring managers looking for the next great rep star, whatever it is, one, are we are those type of skills something that can be taught? Do you find them to be more natural, you know, like a God-given skill? Or um, if it's something to be taught, then whenever we are looking for our next superstar, what could be like leading indicators that they would be able to kind of dig into it? Oh my gosh. It is so funny. You saw me looking down. I was trying to look on my bookshelf. So this is funny. I am really <laughs> horrible at remembering titles of books. And I have to like constantly think of them. I can't find it real there on my shelf. But um, purposeful practice. Mm. You're not just this whole, oh, you're born with it, right? Um, absolutely. Skills can be taught. Now, there's, and, you know, we have relationships um, with uh, industry analysts. And, you know, we had this conversation as I was building out our uh, career path from our development reps over to an AE role. And um, they challenged me in what I call soft skills, right? They're mm -hmm. like, Julie, can you really influence those soft skills? Should you really be spending your time there versus what they need to do in the day-to-day -day job, right? They really yeah. look at selling motions. Um, so, you know, we had that kind of fun, tough love battle. Um, I have in the learning paths, those soft skills. I leverage because I don't need to recreate the wheel, right? We have a relationship with LinkedIn Learning. There's plenty of other, go one. There's tons of other resources out there where you can get um, training on that. Mm. And absolutely, I think it's important. One of the biggest skills we worked on last year as a whole, and I saw it not only ourselves, right? Like you go online and LinkedIn and anyone who's, you know, broadcasting, doing podcasts around empathy, right? A a empathy was like the number one skill mm -hmm. that we saw that needed to be taught and replicated. Um, the piece that when you start doing a skill will model and you start really evaluating, what is it? What are those indicators? You're really looking for people with a growth mindset. Yeah. You want people that are open to change. You want people that are always looking to better themselves, to better the people around them, right? Um, it doesn't mean we always agree with the change. It doesn't mean that we're always happy that we have to put this in the CRM. And now you've, you know, digitized our account plans and opportunity plans. So that's more work that I have to do. But that's where it's our job to really help them understand why it's important, not only for us as sellers, 
but for our buyers, right? We're really creating a better customer experience. Mm. So I'm going to digress a little bit into um, seller deficit disorder, this whole, you don't know me and you don't know my business, right? The best reps are the ones that absolutely know their buyers. They know their business. They know the buyer's customers and their business, right? Those are the ones that take the time, they document it, they share it within your organization. So that way from the beginning, right? You want someone from that, the time they pick up the phone or email or whatever, that it's being tracked so that everyone that interacts with that person knows and understands who they are. And all you're doing is validating yeah. the information, right? Oh, has anything changed since we last spoke? This is what we talked about. This is what this is what I shared with Katie. Are we still on track? Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, no, something changed. Great. What is that? Tell us. Oh, they forgot. Oh, they forgot to tell you this. Okay, fine. Right? That's the kind of relationship that we're really looking to build. It's the those that are self-aware, growth mindset, but it can be taught. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep moving. To our development, which we already kind of covered a little bit, which is fine, <laughs> right? We're aligned. We've done our research and we know our metrics. And now we need to build and execute the plan. And you need to think about a mix of approaches. No one, no one person learns the same way. I'm a very visual and auditory learner. Okay. I like to see video. I like to, but then I also like to read. So I like a little bit of both. So you really want to think about that blended learning approach. I like to see coaching initiatives at organizations that go beyond just that direct manager. I think that's really important. I've seen it work time and time again, even beyond the enablement team, right? You know, we're all coaches as well. So who better than your peer, right? You want to hear from the superstar or someone else that you've seen be successful in your organization. So be really deliberate in your approach. Think about the pairs as you pair them up. You want to make sure you're creating this open and safe environment. And, and that has a whole, that's like a whole nother webinar, right? But really you want to have an open and safe environment. You want people that have a difference of what, where they are, but can communicate and they're going to be open to each other. Okay. The other thing you want to make sure, um, Otherwise, it will not be successful. It goes back to alignment, which is to have a coaching format, methodology, structure. Whoever is going to be doing coaching needs to understand and be versed in that structure. So that way, the terms you're using, the vernacular is the same, the approach is the same. When I come to Katie and we're having the conversation, she knows and has that expectation and knows. So again, I'm creating a safe and open environment. And it, it sounds a lot harder than it is. It's really not. And there's all different kinds of coaching formats out there. So, you know, pick, pick the best one, hit me up if you don't have it, you know, one that you like, but um, they're out there. There's always a need for formal learning. You're going to have that structure. We, you know, touched on maybe some LinkedIn modules. You're going to have your product, your sales methodology process, your tools, your technology, you're rolling out, right? That's what I call formal learning that you're, you're using. Maybe you're going to have some use of video. Think about having supplement materials, data sheets, things like that. Again, you want to have that mixed medium to help people. You're going to have some instructor-led training as well. All of those different ways to really help people where they're at. And we are really big on practicing before you talk to the customer. So mm -hmm. everything has its place, right? You practice beforehand. We use our, our coaching solution to do that. You can use one-on-ones, role plays to do that as well. And you want to practice before they get out there. Then after they're out there, you follow that up with all the other tools we talked about already with recording to see, is it really working? Right. And again, you can even do it through shadowing and, you know, calls and things like that uh, real time, which really helps us bring to that informal learning. So when we think about informal learning, which is really popular, but I always caution as an M1 professional, I really caution that informal learning because you want to make sure that it's aligned with what you're doing, right? You could have a top salesperson that does not follow any of your methodologies, any of your processes that's out there 
trying to train everybody informally with different platforms, right? Okay, that's not going to help you replicate what you're trying to do when you have a set process in place. It's only going to go so far. So the type of informal learning we're talking about is taking that call recording, taking a, you know, a video Zoom where someone had a really good session, snip it out, make that, you know, a little uh, tidbit, shark bite, we call them, you know, what micro learning, whatever you want to call it, right? So that someone can learn real time, you're hearing it exactly as it happened. You're like, oh, okay, that's great. And think about that. Use the technology that you have in place. We're a Slack shop. I know people have teams, right? Whatever communication tool to celebrate successes. I'm not just talking, hey, I signed this deal, inked it, done. No, I'm talking about I overcame this objection. Here's what happened. Hey, I used this email specifically template. I used it with this asset and I got the best return I've ever gotten, right? Use your team meetings to do that same kind of informal learning and coaching and being able to help each other. These are all ways that you can really help develop your teams um, and do it in a more sustainable, scalable and repeatable way. That's like always my kind of mantra uh, in anything we're developing because you know we only have so much time at the end of the day. And of course, use your trusted professional groups like Sales Hacker, right? Those are other great ways, you know, webinars and recordings and things like that that you can share with your team. So in something that, that I'm curious on your thoughts with as we think about like these informal sessions, we think of our huddles and short team meetings, morning standups. Um, when we think about that in relation to reducing churn and repeating what works well for our top performers, how, what are your thoughts, I guess, around having some of those top performers kind of take leadership type roles by presenting this information in these sessions? How has that affected um, you know, what the dynamics are, I guess. Do you build that type of, of culture where people have an opportunity to raise hands? What does that look like? Oh my gosh. Thank you for bringing it up so much. So as we all know, there are only a finite number of leadership positions in a sales organization, right? Some organizations have levels, you know, uh, you have a junior level, then maybe you have a mid tier and then you have a senior level, whatever the role is, development reps, AEs, you know, even myself in an ambulance, right? You have those roles. There's only so far you can go until someone leaves, right? Until a manager gets promoted or leaves. So how do you help elevate those people? How do you, that are looking for that leadership and that? So absolutely, this is where the peer-to-peer -peer coaching, peer-to-peer -peer sharing comes into play. Now, I, I was looking at the chat about sharing calls and things like that. You always want to create that safe space. You're having that conversation with that person one-on-one. -on -one. Some people like to be behind the scenes. Some people don't want it. They could be the rock star of your team. They still like being in the shadows, right? You have to respect and understand that and work with them and, and to where they are at in their career. But for those that really want to shine, absolutely. Absolutely. Use them, use an example. You know, if you're going to be sharing a recording, you're always asking permission internally to make sure you do so. Um, we had a really fun certification program and we had to say a customer's name as part of our use case, right? As part of our, hey, don't take our word for it, right? Here's our customer. It was a difficult name. So, and I am very big on people saying people's names correctly. So, we had a fun highlight reel, but I still went to that person who we all championed because she said it the best and said, hey, can I snip this out and we're going to play it in our highlight reel? And she said, absolutely, of course. Right. And it was a lot of fun. But I still asked permission, even though, you know, spirit and intent, everything was there just to make sure that that got checked. So it is great ways that that people can take more of a leadership role without mm -hmm. true people leadership responsibilities. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else on questions coming in? I think we're good. Uh, no, I think we're good. All right. So let's bring it all together, right? Begin with that end in mind. Identify the metrics that you need to track based on your company objectives, right? You go all the way to what are the highest objectives of the organization, and then you bring it down into the various roles. You're sharing the metrics. You're sharing the metrics widely. Everyone's on the same page. Help your teams 
to understand how to leverage the data. Make sure you have the data in places that they can leverage, whether it's your CRM, right? We use scorecards, however that's set up. Make sure that they have access to it, they understand it, and you can have those conversations to it. Implement your training and your coaching programs to support their development before they fall behind. If we're only tracking that end number of quota, it's too late already, right? You need to be able to impact and make that difference. Communication, 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 understanding that why, setting those clear expectations by role so you can increase the employee engagement. We touched on this a lot, right? To reduce that churn. We want to increase our retention. We want to have happy employees, happy, engaged employees are productive employees. And, you know, we touched on it a little bit, but not really. We are so many of us in a remote environment. I've been in a remote environment for seven, eight years. No, eight years. I don't know. I lost track already. But like way before it was necessary or cool. Okay. People are still struggling. People are still having a hard time. The camera thing, you know. These are those soft skills, making sure that they know how to be on camera, making sure they know how to read body language and cues. As you can see, I'm a hand person and I do a lot of body language. Some people have, this is a new one, resting business face. That was a new one I heard recently, thought it was kind of fun. Um, Just making sure that they know how to do that, how they can be successful. And it's harder to tell if your employees are engaged when they're not there in the office with you, right? So you do have to take those extra steps. You do have to make sure that you're having those conversations around, hey, are you okay? And empathy starts with the managers to their employees, employees with each other and the colleagues, not just the employees, those sellers over to their buyers, right? We all play a part in that. So, so, with some of these key takeaways, I know that we've got some questions sure. coming in. Sure. Um, well, this is interesting. We'll kind of ask that a little bit later. But um, whenever we're looking, and, and these are some things that, as we've seen all of these topics holistically now and how they play a role with each other, what do you do for some of these newer managers? And what would you encourage them to look at? Obviously you know, do trainings, learn, kind of one of the things we talked about, right? Mm -hmm. But as they're implementing different tactics, as they're anxious because they're trying something new, they're hoping it works, what would you encourage to them? What are some strategies maybe that you've you've tried that you would recommend um, to really help their reps truly understand what data looks like for them, how, what it means to them, not just, oh, this is how much I hit my number, but, oh, with my prospect at this time, and I send these emails out at this time of day to the, these types of people and this type of organization, this is the response I get. So how do you help a, a younger manager as they're trying to teach almost their peers on, on how to really understand that data? Gosh. Great, great question and a topic um, that comes up all the time because often who becomes managers? Great sellers, right? Oh, we take our top sellers and we promote them to managers without an infrastructure in place to support them. So enablement starts with your management team. You have to enable your managers to do their jobs. You have to be able to support them. The most successful, even within myself, the most impactful managers that I've had all the way up to a CEO, right? Which I've been fortunate to have and been in those relationships where I have one-on-one conversations with my CEOs is transparency and authenticity. Okay. If you're fake and you are not your authentic self, it's going to show. Mm -hmm. Be transparent, be authentic, right? Have the conversations with them. Hey, we're trying this out. We're seeing if it works. Okay. I think there's more respect. I've seen more respect in that sense to have that conversation with them, really helping them understand what leads to what, right? Breaking it down as you were saying, okay, I need to do this many, this many calls, breaking down whatever the metrics and the numbers are. If you need 150 of a specific activity a week, okay, then, you know, you need to do 30 a day. Okay, so what happens if you don't do 30 that day because you have five meetings on the calendar? All right, now you have to make up for it. Breaking it down 
and understanding how they learn, understanding what's important to them, I think is really important. And I know we're running close on time and there is a really good question I do want to get to, if that's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah. Right. Gigi, great, great question. And Gigi's question is, is it mandatory before becoming a sales enabler that you have sales experience? So it depends on the role and it depends on the organization. So um, I think it is extremely helpful, right, to have had that sales experience because you do lead from that place of empathy. I have been in your shoes, okay? Um, I know a very accomplished sales enabler that does not have direct sales experience. Interesting enough, led a business development team, but it was not a quota carrying rep herself. Hmm. So, and again, very much able to do her job, do it exceptionally well. Fabulous coach, knows and understands because of the personality, takes the time to know and understand the role. So I think it can be done. Um, and one thing I would love is, you know, I have people that reach out to me looking for sales enablement roles. They know that we work with a lot of companies. So they come to us, you know, we're part of sales enablement society as well and others to, to help others. So when we pass along job descriptions, nothing frustrates me more. So if you're, if you are a hiring manager, rethink your job descriptions. There's lots of tools out there to help you as far as diversity, equity, and inclusion, and looking at the language you put in there. Look at the experience. Sales enablement as an, as a direct field and title role has been only about seven or eight years. So if you say you want someone with 10 years of experience in sales enablement with that title, you're far-fetched. It was learning and development. It was probably something else, right? Mm. I've had this discussion with, you know, my VP, right? So this is because we kind of joked about it. Make sure you're realistic in your requests, your requirements, and what you're putting in those descriptions. Get the best candidate. Get the right people for the job. And guess what? They can learn the skills and the knowledge they need along the way, too. The cultural fit is much more important to me. I love that. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, it's all about the culture. So I know that we are kind of getting towards the end of our time before we leave. Oh, here. Oh, here's a great question, Scott. How do you encourage account execs to teach and help lower level sales reps? Okay. So hopefully you don't have an organization where it's backstabbing. I was in one of those as the quota carrying sales rep. So usually we have territories, we have set accounts, however that structure is, essentially you're not competing for the same pool. So what do you have to lose? You don't have anything to lose to share that knowledge. And by giving back, you're growing yourself as well, right? That's the mindset I would love, love, love to teach them. Unfortunately, I've been part of organizations that even as territories were aligned and there was no way they were going to be able to steal someone else's account, they still had this aversion to sharing. It starts at the top and lead by example. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. Well, I think that is all that we have for everyone today. Thank you all so much for attending. Thank you so much, Julie and the team at Brain Shark. This was so incredibly encouraging for those of you who needed that validation that you're on the right path. Very exciting and maybe challenging for those of you that are starting to get started on this. And um, if they want to get a hold of you, Julie, what's the best way for them to go about that? Oh my gosh, yes, please. And here, I'm going to stop share so they can like see both of us, right? So um, please reach out via LinkedIn. I'm there, um, you know, ask some questions. I love, as you could tell, doing this, this is what I thrive on. So, and of course, you can always reach us at Brain Shark as well. But yeah, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining everyone. Thank you, Brain Shark. Thank you, Julie. We really appreciate it. And everyone have a great rest of your week. Thanks, everyone.